The last story that Flannery O'Connor ever wrote was Revelation. The story itself actually comes to her in what seems like a revelation. She had spent all of these times in doctor's offices and actually the last eight to 10 months of her life was in and out of the hospital. And she wrote this story, literally hiding it under her pillow at first because the doctors told her that she couldn't work. And uh, once she said, you know, can I write a little fiction? <laughs> and then basically they let her write it, but um, because they didn't consider fiction work. And yet this work I think is one of her best. It's one of her best short stories by far. Aesthetically, morally, it is a revelation. And the story begins in a doctor's waiting room. So biographically, you can imagine this was a setting very familiar to Flannery O'Connor, but then if you read it, not just at the literal level, but also at the figurative. And for Flannery, you, you have to always begin at the literal, but you move through and with the literal into the figurative. You can't ever bypass one to the other, but at the same time, you move through one to the other. So the doctor's waiting room becomes this purgatorial setting in which the sick, the sinners, uh, will eventually move into the place of healing and redemption. And as Mrs. Ruby Turpin, who's the primary character of this story, as she walks into the waiting, waiting room, she's this large figure, right? And she has this these beady black eyes. And uh, later we will see that she and her husband, Claude, actually own pigs. And so Mrs. Turpin herself kind of resembles one of these creatures at the beginning. And if you think of the gospel stories, the pigs are the characters that the demons are sent into when they are sent, when they're exercised from a man by Jesus. They're just sent into the pigs and then go off the cliff. So here we have Ruby Turpin, and in a sense, she is legion at the beginning. As I mentioned sometimes to my students, when we've read like Surprised by Joy by C.S. Lewis, when he is about to convert to Christianity and Surprised by Joy, the confession comes before the conversion, and he confesses, I am legion. He realized he had all of these sins within him, all of this darkness. I am the worst of sinners is the place you begin the process of purgatory. You have to confess and repent. And here we have Mrs. Turpin, not yet ready to confess and repent, but at the beginning, she's legion. She walks in and she's looking for a place for her and Claude to be able to sit and she's judging everyone by their shoes. How can she tell who is of what class and what kind of person? And it's these externals that we begin to see dominate her imagination or her conception of other people. There's a girl in the room that we want to pay attention to that will become a catalyst towards Mrs. Turpin's conversion. The room, the girl is a uh, fat girl of 18 or 19 scowling into a thick blue book titled Human Development. And she herself has her face covered in acne, but it is blue with acne. And I think the color blue is supposed to be resonant for us. In medieval paintings, blue is the Marian color, right? Uh, there's And she's Mary Grace, we find out, is her name. And so this image that she will be the conduit of grace, this unexpected source of grace in this ugly girl that scowls and uh, is blue with acne. And that's the person that will actually bring about this revelation for Mrs. Turpin. In the beginning, we notice that she has a problem with seeing, that she sees people according to categories. Later, we will recognize she also is among the deaf in some sense. She is hard of hearing because she'll be listening to this gospel song that is playing above her on the radio. And the gospel song, uh, she can't remember all the words. You know, you're going along the blank, 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 and all go to mine, and we'll all go blank along together, and all along the blank will help each other out, smiling through any kind of weather. She, it says, Mrs. Turbin didn't catch every word, but she caught enough to agree with the spirit of the thing. So here's an exact contrast to what Flannery wants us to do as readers. She doesn't want us to bypass the concrete for the mystery, for the abstract, or for the spiritual meaning. And here's Mrs. Turpin, only judging people by their concrete particulars without considering their spirit. But then when she considers spiritual things, she does so without considering the word itself. And so you see this kind of neo-manichaeanism and gnosticism again that flannery is always trying to fight the kind in which you don't understand the intimate connection between the flesh and the spirit and the body and the spirit mrs turpin looks down on those people that are around her she sees one woman um, that looks like she must be white trash and therefore 
you know, couldn't be worth anything. She said, there was nothing you could tell her about people like them. Notice the them, the categorization of the us and them that she didn't know already. And also notice there was nothing you could tell Mrs. Turpin that she didn't know already. That lack of ability to know beyond, to be in the process of knowing, it becomes crucial. If you gave them everything in two weeks that we've broken or filthy or cut up for Lightwood, she knew all this from her own experience. Help them, them you must, but help them you couldn't. And so she has classified and reduced everyone around her. And this classification becomes very problematic because she has reduced people to the classification. She sees them as white trash. She has seen them as products. They are dehumanized objects to her, right? This ugly girl has been classified. This white trash has been classified. And when you can classify people and name them that way according to their external, you know, superficial categories and then objectify them that you're going to miss the Imago Dei, you're going to miss their free will, the, the nature of them being in process or able to be transformed, their um, heart, their mind, their spirit. I mean, all of the things that make us human beings are not only fleshly, but also, right? It's the both and. When we look at some of Flannery O'Connor's uh, other stories, we see these two eyes. It's always the matter of having both eyes open. And we consider the Pentocrator that had the eye of mercy and the eye of justice. In this conception of the world, only justice can exist. People are good or bad. People are trashy or decent. People are black or white. And they, she's constantly condemning and condescending. The world around her is reduced into these categories in which some deserve justice and some do not. And in that concept, there is no room for mercy. She doesn't have an eye for mercy. People don't have the ability to change. Mercy only makes sense within a system in which people have the opportunity to convert, convert and grow and change. And as she's listening to these songs on the loudspeaker and as she's classifying the people around her, she begins to get her heart rises with gratitude because she's better than everyone else. And of course, this always strikes my students as funny, you know, that she is considering other people in contrast to herself and seeing herself as so much better. But there's also a, a real point underlining this humor because she says that she's, she feels grateful. She said, if there's one thing I am, it's grateful. When I think who all I could have been besides myself and what I got, a little bit of everything and a good disposition besides, why, I just feel like shouting, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for making everything the way it is. And she has this pang of joy. So if you read enough O'Connor, you start seeing these moments of, of gratitude and joy, these false ways of identifying virtues as emotions, the subjectification of these virtues. And we know gratitude as a virtue is a practice that in the midst of circumstances in which you do not want to feel gratitude, you practice it. For example, if you are in the midst of suffering, and I, I've mentioned this in other circumstances, but you know, in Corey Ten Boom's uh, writings about being in the concentration camps, thank God for the fleas. You give thanks in all circumstances. That's the practice of the virtue of gratitude because you realize everything is a gift. You could have not existed. And so everything is a gift in that mentality because you don't know what providence is doing. Right, You believe in the author that is above you, and you're not the highest one on the ladder, whereas, whereas Mrs. Turbin believes she's the highest on the ladder, and that there is a ladder that goes up and down, and that there is a bottom rung, and there is a top rung, and she's on the top rung, right? And so this is the misconception she has. Is it, you know, she's standing in the waiting room. She's always on top. And she has gratitude for being placed there as, as though she's entitled and deserves to be there. So it's the opposite of gratitude. And that pang of joy she's feeling is not actually the practice or virtue of joy. And Flannery points this out in letters, um, and actually in an essay, uh, The Fiction Writer and His Country, in which we've confused joy and satisfaction. So here she is satisfied with herself. 
whereas joy in C.S. Lewis's conception should be about longing for something that is beyond this world. And you have joy because you sense there's more that you could be given, and there will be more that you're given, right, if you have this eternal concept of human beings and our pilgrimage elsewhere. And so she's misunderstanding the word joy. She's misunderstanding the word gratitude. And in that moment, the human development book strikes her in the eye and knocks her down. And then this girl begins to choke her, her neck, right? And um, Mrs. Turpin actually, is in some ways, sees herself in the girl's face because now her face is turning blue from being choked, like the girl's face is blue with acne. And... Uh, the girl says, you are go back to hell, you old warthog. And so the girl names Mrs. Turpin a warthog from hell. And it's this clash in identification that begins to move Mrs. Turpin out of her self-satisfied knowledge. I know everything from my experience. I classify everyone. I name everyone and thus I'm done with them to a place of tension between the name that someone else has given her. Mary Grace has given her a name that Mrs. Turpin cannot fit with how she knows herself. And that scandal, that stumbling block, sets her down this road throughout the rest of the story to discover her true identity. Mrs. Turpin then returns home and she's wrestling with this experience in which Someone has called her a warthog from hell. This was the revelation that she received, and it's not the revelation that she wanted. She's been given something that she doesn't want. And she has this moment where she is dealing with the workers on her farm who are African-American, and yet Mrs. Turpin has reduced them and caricatured them, and then they respond performatively to her as caricatures, and she begins to feel the tension that I have caricatured them. I can't talk to them as people because I've reduced them and made them not act like people with me because I have such, I had such a little expectation of them and it frustrates her. And, you know, there's this moment with her husband in which they're laying in bed and she wants some other revelation. She wants to know that she's a good person, that she's loved and that she deserves love. And he only opens one eye and there's this sense of, neither of them having both eyes with which to see the world. And she also begins to realize that she can, you know, she's reaching out to these African-American workers on her farm. She's reaching out to her husband, but yet she knew everything from her own self-experience. So we see that she is moving beyond this self-experience, this form of knowledge that's only internal. And she is bathing the hogs that are on their farm and starts yelling at God. And it's this Job moment, right? The, um, she compares herself to Job and these African-American workers to the comforters of Job earlier on the story. So we're, we're, we're supposed to make those, those jumps figuratively to understand Mrs. Turpin as this biblical figure. She's also very prophetic. She's like the psalmist screaming at God. And she just leaps up before God, like holding onto the railing. Go on, call me a hog. Call me a hog again from hell. Call me a warthog from hell. Put that bottom rail on the top. There'll still be a top and a bottom. And nothing, she hears nothing, a gurbling sound, an echo. And a final surge of fury shook her. And she roared, who do you think you are? And then the color of everything, field and crimson sky, burned for a moment with a transparent intensity and the question carried over the pasture, across the highway and the cotton field and returned to her clearly like an answer from beyond the wood. And in Flannery O'Connor, that's always significant, the, this idea of from beyond, that it's returning. And so this is a dialogue that she has sparked up outside of her internal self, inside of her mind, she has asked a question and does not answer it herself, but God responds by asking the question of her, who do you think you are? It's putting her in her place, her rightful place as a creature created by a creator, right? And that lowering of her self-image that she's not on the top, that in his system, he is on the top. God and author of everything is on the top. 
And when she has this revelation, she receives a vision. And the vision that comes to her, of course, is a vision of saints moving towards eternity. And you, you can see this gradual moving of her vision because at first she sees them still classified. There's a swinging bridge extending up from the earth through a field of living fire. This is the purgatorial fire. And upon it are a vast horde of souls rumbling toward heaven, whole companies of her categories, white trash clean for the first time in their lives, and bands of black inward in white robes, and battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs. So you see her vision of things. That's how she's looking at this revelation and bringing up the end. So the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So here she becomes the last, was a procession of a tribe of people. Here's that tribalism. Claude and herself, who had always had a little of everything and the God-given wit to use it right. And this is where she transforms. She leaned forward. And what she notes is that they have shocked and altered faces as their virtues are being burned away. So everything before that one sentence is her looking at this through her filter, through her one-eyed lens of classification, that they all belong to these different categories. There is a top and a bottom rail. Fine, God, you put me on the bottom instead of on the top. And then all of those virtues, so-called virtues, were being burned away. And in that moment, there's a transformation for Mrs. Turpin. She lowers her, lamp, her hands and grips the hog pin, and her eyes are small and fixed and unblinking. The vision fades, and she remains. She just stops. Something has happened. And she has to wrestle with that next part of her initiation toward the kingdom. She gets down. She descends, turns off the faucet, and makes a slow way on the path. But here's one of the key signatures, that something has happened, that there is a slow path. There is a pilgrimage home now for Mrs. Turpin. She hears cricket choruses, but what she hears, instead of just hearing crickets, being annoyed by them, being frustrated by them, silencing them in her mind as she did that gospel song in the beginning, now the cricket choruses are heard as the voices of the souls climbing upward into the starry field and shouting, hallelujah, praise Jehovah, right? This is worship. This is true humility that she begins to understand even the crickets are crying out. Even the crickets are singing his praises. And she herself is nothing but a bug, right? She herself is human, is greater than a bug, but also this revelation of the least of these, that she is moving towards that understanding of the world and her place in it. So it's a beautiful story in Flannery's work. Hopefully these stories are all teaching us how, how to see and how to not see according to tribes and them and us and classification, but how to see more with God's eyes, that we should be grateful, that we can experience true joy, and that we can shout out when we hear the crickets sing, hallelujah.